Philosophy Battle, the most entertaining presentation of philosophy you'll ever find on the internet, probably. Now entering the battlefield of philosophy of science, Philosoph. Falsification, a weapon I made a big deal about in the previous episode. What is it? Let's go to what Karl Popper himself says about it. I'm going to go over conjectures and refutations, the growth of scientific knowledge. Now I'm in a room with a lot of weird echoing and twinging noises. I hope it's okay, but uh, let's try to do this anyway in a quick and smooth enough way. But I'm going to devote this video just to Karl Popper's uh, falsification itself because I need to emphasize how important it is to understand falsification as a great weapon in the field of the philosophy of science. Even if it is no longer used, it is important to understand, to have an understanding of what science is and how it works philosophically. So Karl Popper starts out saying, let me give you a report on my work in the philosophy of science. The problem that bugged me is distinguishing science from non-science. I know normally we say it's science is empirically proceeding from observation or experiment. But then, what about methods that also use observation or experiment, but aren't science? Look at astrology, with its stupendous mass of empirical evidence based on observation. Now, just to be clear for some of you who might have been confused just momentarily, uh, astrology is when we are talking about horoscopes and your star signs. Are you a Capricorn or a Scorpio or a Libra? Uh, that's astrology, whereas astronomy is when you're talking about the actual stars, the sizes of stars required to have black holes or pulsars, that's astronomy. So back to what Karl Popper is saying. He says, but listen, it's not astrology that started bugging me. After the collapse of the Austrian Empire, there was a revolution in Austria full of new theories. Among them was Einstein's theory of relativity. Three others that interested me were Marx's theory of history, Freud's psychoanalysis, and Adler's individual psychology. There was a lot of BS talk about these theories, especially Einstein's, but those who checked out relativity were hype as fun when Eddington's eclipse observation brought first important confirmation in 1919 of Einstein's theory. A lot of people were still talking about the other three. I even worked with Adler, but by the summer of 1919, I wasn't feeling so impressed by them. I wondered why are they so different from physical theories like Newton's or Einstein's theories. A lot of us doubted the truth of Einstein's theory at the time, so it's not even a matter of doubting the others more. It wasn't a matter of exactness either. Now he says this, but you know, it kind of is a sort of issue for him later on as we'll sort of see, and we'll see it being brought up even by Kuhn after that. He says, quoting here, I felt these three theories, though posing as sciences, had in fact more in common with primitive myths than science, that they resembled astrology rather than astronomy. Listen, admirers of Marx, Freud, and Adler were impressed by their apparent explanatory power. It seems to explain practically everything. Confirming instances were everywhere. The world was full of verification of their theories. And people who couldn't see their theories were simply denying it because it's against your class interest or repressions that were unanalyzed. Their supporters emphasized their constant stream of confirmations, verifications. A Marxist couldn't even open a newspaper without confirmation on every single page of their interpretation of history, revealing class bias, not just by what is said, but even by what isn't said. Freud's analysts emphasized their theory was constantly verified in clinical observations. And as for Adler, I'll even tell you a personal experience. I tried to tell him about a case that I didn't think was very Adlerian, Ad Adler, wasn't very Adler-like. But boom, he had no problem explaining his theory anyway, in terms of inferiority feelings. But he didn't even see the kid for the case. So I'm like, how can you be so sure? And he's like, trust me, I've seen this a thousand times. So I'm like, yeah, if this is another case for you just to confirm your theories, well then I guess this is a thousand and one now, isn't it? Right? So I asked myself, is it really confirmation that one can interpret an observation through their theory? No, it means little, because I realize every conceivable case 
could be interpreted in the light of Adler's theory or equally Freud's. Then Popper gives an example of a man who 1. pushes a child into the water to drown him and 2. a man who jumps into the water I guess to save the child. He says both can equally be explained by Adler and Freud. Freud would say that the first man suffered from repressions, an eatable complex, and the second man achieved some kind of sublimation. And for Adler, the first man had an inferiority complex that he needed to prove that he dared to commit a crime. And even the second man also had an inferiority complex and needed to prove that he dared to rescue the child. There's no behavior I could think of that they can't explain. They think of that as their strength, but I realize it's their weakness. Einstein was strikingly different. His theory was just confirmed by Eddington's expedition. His theory predicted that light must be attracted to heavenly bodies just like physical objects. So the stars close to the sun would appear as if they moved away from the sun and each other. Now normally you can't see the stars close to the sun, but during an eclipse you can, and Eddington took pictures during an eclipse. The impressive thing is the risk involved. Because if the pictures didn't show what was predicted, the theory is simply refuted. That's totally different from the situation where it's impossible to describe a human behavior that couldn't be claimed as another verified instance of these other theories. So these are my conclusions. 1. It's easy to get confirmation and verification if we look for them. 2. Confirmations only count if it's a risky prediction where it could refute the theory otherwise. 3. Good scientific theory forbids certain things to happen. The more it forbids, the better it is. 4. A theory that can't be refuted is non-scientific. Being irrefutable is not a virtue. 5. Every genuine test of a theory is an attempt to falsify it. Refute it. Testability is falsifiability. 6. Confirming evidence only counts when it's a serious but failed attempt to falsify the theory. And that's what he calls corroborating evidence. So what he means here is that in science, scientists should try to do their best to prove a theory wrong. And failing to prove it wrong is actually what adds to it being more believable. Again, so in science, it's not about how many people prove you right or verify you right, but how many failed to prove you wrong that makes your case. 7. When supporters still support a theory that's being falsified because of ad hoc maneuverments, like reinterpreting the theory or saying there are assumptions that we don't know about, basically excuses, things that always save the theory from being falsified, destroy or at least lower the status of scientific validity. And I call this conventionalist twist or conventionalist stratagem. He says, and I'm quoting here, one can sum up all this by saying the criterion of the scientific status of a theory is its falsifiability, refutability, or testability. Astrology didn't pass this test. They were so impressed by the confirming and verified instances to the point that they were unimpressed or unaffected by unfavorable evidence. Also, they make their prophecies vague enough to explain away anything. To escape falsification, they destroyed testability being vague for that purpose. Typically, this is a soothsayer's techniques. And Marxist founders and followers, too, wound up doing the same thing. Earlier, their predictions were testable, but were falsified. And for those of you who are Marxist, uh, Popper cites in his note two of this piece, uh, the open society and its enemies. Anyway, back to Popper. Marxists gave that conventionalist twist and destroyed their claims to scientific statics they boasted for themselves. On the other hand, the two psychoanalytic theories were simply not testable in the first place. No human behavior could contradict them. I don't doubt that much of it is important, but Freud's epic of the ego, superego, and id isn't all that much closer to scientific status than it is to Greek myth. And yeah, myths can be developed and become testable. Yeah, scientific theories can even originate from myth. Empedocles' theory of evolution by trial and error. Parmenides' myth of the unchanging block universe. Added a dimension becomes Einstein's block universe. So not saying they aren't important, significant, meaningful, or that they're nonsense. Thus, the problem I tried to solve with falsification isn't a problem of meaningfulness, 
significance, truth, or acceptability. The problem it solves is to separate the systems of empirical science and others, whether religious or metaphysical or anything else, between science and pseudoscience. I call this the problem of demarcation, and the solution is the criterion of falsifiability. So this issue of accuracy actually did come up later on because he does seem to suggest that being purposely vague is something that he is definitely criticizing as being non-scientific. So it does seem like actually accuracy is somewhat of an issue, but we'll see that Kuhn later on agrees that it really isn't anyway. Although it seems unclear, at least in this piece, what Popper really feels about accuracy. Other than that, we have this weapon here set up by Sir Karl Popper, the sharpest and cleanest weapon to sever pseudosciences from the real sciences, the criterion of falsification or falsifiability. Let's be clear, that which cannot be shown false under any circumstances cannot be considered scientific. And so with this weapon, the Popperian cuts down the Marxist Freudian and Adlerian, whom would seek to share the credentials of our beloved science. No, you are not like Einstein. You are not science. Philosophers of science and defenders of science might really want this to be the end of the issue, that falsification is such a wonderful weapon that we could simply end it here with falsification alone. Many atheists still use this weapon against theists in conversation and battle to defend their rational ideas being as being scientific rather than being dogmatic into theistic ideas. And you saw that outplaying in the McLean versus Arkansas case. But as I stated, we've moved on beyond that. Poon is what is dropped as a weapon in response to those who wield the weapon of falsification today. And indeed, those who try to defend their pseudosciences because they are being attacked by philosopher sciences who are on the side of science to attack it as a pseudoscience, often Kuhn today is brought up, at least by those sophisticated and well-knowing of the philosophy of science, to smack falsification out the hands of their enemies. But if Kuhn is dropped, the name of Kuhn, if we are working within the schemata of the philosophy of Kuhn, an understanding of that is also very much a means to defend against pseudoscience. So let's have an understanding of that so that we can pull that weapon out of the hands of those trying to defend pseudoscience using Kuhn only because it saves them from falsification. I hope what I just said is not too complicated and didn't go over your head, but let's look at Kuhn next. I've decided to separate a video on Popper and a video on Kuhn because, well, A, I do want us to fully understand falsification well and roundly, but because the video on Kuhn is going to be much longer in that I have much more to say and there's going to be much more to say afterwards to understand the hugely impactful importance of the change between Popper to Kuhn, even though Kuhn himself might really emphasize that it's simply two sides of the same coin, there is huge philosophic underpinnings when we move on to a more Kuhnian system of the philosophy of science. And that brings us into so much more battle. Switching over from falsification to Kuhn's paradigms brings about so many more enemies into the philosophic battlefield. So many more come on wielding dangerous weapons. Funding. I need funding. Some of my videos take 90 plus hours and if you take that 90 and you plus hours that's a lot of time. I can't just churn out these kind of videos with little effort like a react video or an ASMR video or stealing clips of other people's works, cartoons or just reading comments off the internet. So obviously I don't have a lot of videos or a huge fan base. I'm new and I don't know if you know this but YouTube doesn't reward or make it easy for unestablished high quality production YouTube. If anything, they make it way, way harder, especially on shows like mine. So if you think I deserve to exist here and I deserve some support, I humbly, humbly request that you, yes you, actually log into your Google account and subscribe to my channel, watch my videos and 
actually actually share my videos. Now if you're thinking oh the internet has millions of people online and surely someone else can do it, someone else can support this guy, I'm sure a lot of people will do it eventually, well guess what, they won't. And I need and want it to be you to join me on this hardcore awesome philosophical journey. But the best way to ensure the journey continues even without bajillions of subs is by supporting me on Patreon. A few of the dollars you might have spent on garbage food could instead really help fund this production and ensure I keep making more videos on philosophical battles that you're just gonna love so much. While all my early subscribers are special and will be noticed by me definitely, my Patreon supporters will get a special rewards, not just shoutouts but even influence on the direction of the philosophical path itself. Not just in the philosi but also in other battlefields as well. So believe me for a small small YouTuber like me it makes a big difference, I definitely will notice and you will be actually contributing in a meaningful way. Thanks.